Thanks, team. Good morning, everyone. Happy Mother's Day again. <laughs> um, I miss my mom. Um, so uh, those of you who still have your mom with you, cherish them. Cherish them to bits. <laughs> um, today, uh, I'd like to continue with, um, with the series on um, God with us, uh, which is about God's attributes um, and His relationship with us. Last week, we talked about um, God's goodness, right? Today, we talk about that big, huge topic of God's love and how does He relate to us. Specifically, God loves you, so what? Um, so let us, let us commit this time to the Lord before I start. Oh God of love, we misunderstand you so much um, because we're sometimes confused between the world's love and your love. Today, clear the air, Lord. Speak to us. Let us hear your word. Change us that we might really experience true love from you and that we might really share true love with each other amongst your people. Commit this time to you, Lord Jesus. Be, ble- be, be, uh, be glorified and bless us, Lord, with your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So, God loves you. How many times have you heard that word, those three words? In fact, I bet you, as a Christian, you probably heard these three words more than many non-Christians will ever hear. God loves you. God loves you. The trouble with hearing words too many times is you hear things repeated so many times, sometimes we lose that meaning of it, right? I mean, because it's like, okay, God loves you. First time I hear it, pretty cool. Second time I hear it, pretty cool. The thousandth time I hear it, it's like, if anyone tells me God loves you again without actually explaining to me what it means, you know? So, God loves you. What's in it? Um, You know I'm a big fan of Lord of the Rings, right? And so one of the uh, series is The Hobbit. Um, Not as famous as Lord of the Rings itself, but in the third show uh, in in, in the series, which is The Five Armies, um, there was a story where Tauriel, who is an elf, um, she fell in love with a dwarf, which is Kili. Now, her king, King Thranduil, now this king really, really, really disagree with this because he says that, no, you must love your own kind. You cannot fall in love with a dwarf. You got to love an elf, you know? So um, he forbade it. But of course, um, they, as they grew closer, Kili and uh, Tauriel just grew to love each other more and more because their, their values align and they, 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 they connect so well and everything. So at the end of it, spoilers, if you haven't seen this movie, it's already about 20 years old, so hopefully you've seen it. Um, as um, an orc, a fierce orc was just about, was fighting with Tauriel and just about to stab her to death, Kili stepped in a way because he was trying to protect her. And of course, in that fight, Kili died. He just got uh, killed by that orc. And as Tauriel cradled Kili in her arms, she was, she was, of course, really sad. She couldn't realize this love. And so, at the same time, Thranduil, the king, who never, who's very stoic, who said, no, you cannot love. He was looking for her because he was thinking, oh no, you know, is she going to be killed or something? Because, and finally, he reached her and found her holding Kili in, in her arms. And this is what she said to him. She said, look, if this is love, I don't want it. Please take it away from me. Why does it hurt so much? I don't want it. Take it away from me. And, and the interesting thing is, this king, Thranduil, who so forbade his love, 
suddenly realized in, in front of him, this is real love. And you know what his response to her was? Said, she said, why is this, does this hurt so much? He said, because it is real. And tears almost welled out on his eyes. It's one of the most touching scenes for me. You know, I try not to look at it too much because I get teary-eyed as well. Um, and I guess sometimes this reflects how we see God's love in the sense that sometimes, for some reason, we prefer a love, a worldly love that feels good rather than what real love truly is, which sometimes hurts. Sometimes we feel these feelings that are very different from what we think love is because it's so different from worldly love. But why do we have that issue, you know, even amongst Christians, right? It's like we find it hard to accept God's love because God's love is so different, so unusual. And we hear all the time the love of the world, how, it, the, how the world frames love. Love is love. Whatever you feel is love. Dig into yourself. It's love. Whatever you like is love. When, sometimes the world even says, God is love. Amazing, isn't it? But when the world says that, what the world really means is that actually they're saying love is God. They're not saying God is love. They're saying love is God. That's what the world is saying. Christ love above all things, and that is the most important thing, more than God. Love is everything, and therefore, you should worship love. And from there came all the different and broken and the idolatry love that comes in the world. It's very different from what John told us about love. John tells us that God is love. Love is God and God is love are two completely different things. If love is God, then we should worship love, not God. But if God is love, then we should worship God, is it not? So today, I guess I wanted to bring us back to realizing what is true love. Now, the thing about this is that, look, we can't be blamed for getting love wrong. From the time we were born, we learn about love from the world. As soon as we were born, the first thing we learn about love is from our parents. The love of our mom, love of our dad, these are good love. Love of self-sacrifice, of parents sacrificing for us as their ch children. That's why uh, we love our parents, right? But then, as we grow, we learn from love from our friends. We learn of love from Hollywood, lots of movies. And that's where everything starts going off. Um, and, and, you know, the world tells us love is love and all these things. And we, 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 we do learn from the world first. That's why it's important today that we go back to Scripture and go, what is love? Specifically, three things. What is the meaning of love? What is love? Secondly, how does God's love work? You know, what's the action of love? And lastly, what's the proof of love? What is proof of God's love for you? These are questions that we ask all the time, even as Christians, right? So God loves you. We're going to cover all that today. So let's start with what is love. John tells us that whoever loves has been born of God and knows God because God is love. Now this is a very important thing. Remember, we just said that love is God is not the same as God is love. Um, it, uh, if you think about the world's love, right? Did you know that recently um, there's a survey done uh, about the world's most promiscuous countries? You know where New Zealand fell? 
New Zealand is number three most com- promiscuous country in the entire world. If love in the world is so good, why is there so much promiscuity? If love is in the world is so good, why is there so much divorce? Why is there so much broken marriages? Why is there so much betrayals? So much um, of uh, infidelity and all these things just keeps happening and happening and happening again. Why is love so broken? And what John is telling us here is it is broken because we, we disconnect love from God. Now, Jesus himself said, remember? Jesus said that, look, you, even though you who are evil, you who are wicked, you would give love to your children. You would, you would take care of your children. How much more would your Father, who loves you, give you? So, Jesus himself illustrated that there is love in this world, but if you disconnect it from the love of God, if you disconnect love from God, it, is, it becomes meaningless. Solomon tried that in Ecclesiastes. He pursued love like mad. He pursued love, in fact, through to how many hundred concubines? 350 or something like that. That's insane. Um, but, you know, and he says, in the end, I pursued love, and in the end, it's meaningless, absolutely meaningless, because I pursued love without God. Um, so the two things that um, essentially John is telling us, one, love comes from God. Even wicked people love their children. All that love Love is the grace of God given to man. If God did not give this, this world would be a horrible, horrible, horrible place. But there is love in this world. But more importantly, secondly, there's no meaning without God. There's no meaning in love without God. Love is defined by who God is. So if you take God out, if we take God out of the picture, love has no meaning at all. So what the implications of this is this. If love is God, well, get to know love. But if God is love, let's get to know God. You and I are going to experience the depth of love according to our relationship with God. The greater our relationship with God, the greater our love we experience and the love we can give to God. So that's that implication. Second thing, how does God's love work? This one's interesting. Um, John says this, God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us. Now, this is the interesting thing. This is why every time we say God loves you, sometimes it falls on deaf ears. You know, we fall asleep about that. Um, and, but that's because... It does not stop there. You notice John, he could have said, if this is love, that he loved you. No. He said, if this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us. Now, why did John have to say that? I mean, that's like, what? Why do you have to tell me that, that not that we love him? It's because John knows our hearts. When we hear that God loves us, sometimes pride takes over. For some of us, we might think, yeah, I deserve God's love. I love myself too. (laughs) Of course God loves me. Obviously, that's wrong. And I know that most of us, if not all of us, don't have that attitude. But there's another one that also puts us wrong as well. And that is, no, I don't deserve God's love. I'm a sinful person. I've done this. I'm not a good person. I'm not lovable. I don't deserve God's love. And therefore, we try very hard to fulfill God's laws, to please Him in order for Him to love us. And that puts us wrong as well. What John is saying here is, he's saying that we play absolutely no part in God's love. Now, if we look at that statement by itself, it feels like, oh, that's very disempowering, isn't it? That's like, yeah, I have no part to play in God's, God's love. But until we are willing to accept that, we're not going to feel 
we're not going to be experiencing God's love because we need to know that we, actually those of us who think we don't deserve God's love, we are right. I don't. You don't. But God loves you anyway. That is the grace of God. And more importantly, He showed it through Jesus Christ. We, Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life to the Father. Now, if the Father is love, then what does that mean? The implication is Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life to love. So sometimes we bring our feeble love to Jesus and we think, Lord, this love is really very little. It just has, it, 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 my love is so faint for you. It's just not enough. Bring it to Jesus like they brought the bread and the fish to Jesus. In Jesus' hands, when He presents it to the Father, He presents it accepting, as in, um, accepted by the Father because the Father accepts everything from the Son. We live and love through Jesus Christ. And the last thing is, the third thing is, what is the proof that God's love, uh, proof of God's love for you? Um, can I have a show of hands? How many of you all sometimes feel that God's love is distant? Just show of hands. Sometimes, right? Yeah, okay. I feel you. I feel you. I, I go through that quite a lot sometimes because... Um, yeah, you know, all these doubts and things come in, into our mind. But I want, to, I want to encourage you that that God's love is proven as we love each other. We have each other in the church. That's why in church it is important that we come together. When we come together, we get to love each other. God is visible when you love. So no one has ever seen God, says John. If we love one another, God abides in us. It is a very strange thing in Christianity when it comes to love. There's n I don't know whether you find it weird or not, but in Christianity, I think it's the only religion I've heard of where God tells you and commands you, you must love one another. God says, if you don't love one another, you're not with me. Love one another as Christians to each other. Now, it's a strange thing, and you wonder why. Why? How can God command love? Love is a feeling, isn't it? Uh, if you love someone, you love someone. If you don't, you don't. How can you? You must love your brothers and sisters in Christ. <laughs> well, I think I'll illustrate by uh, looking at our family. So when Isaac, Rebecca, and Timothy were quite young, Sorry, I didn't ask for permission to talk, to talk about you, but um, we always told them when they were kids to say, look, you three must, we kind of command them. We say, you three must love one another. Your brothers and sisters, you must love one another. I know you're fighting right now, but you must love one another. It's like, how can we command them? Well, we can command them because why? Because they are family. We tell them, look, blood is thicker than water. If the world falls away, you've only got all three of you left. You must love one another because you are family. It's what I'm trying to illustrate is God can ask us as Christians to love one another because we are His family. We are His blood brothers in Christ. We are in Christ. We sang of God's, uh, Jesus' blood that cleanses our sins. On a side note, I also like to tell you that the world likes to trick you in this one. Uh, the world will say, um, hey, look, you know, God says, love, love everyone, right? So you should love us just as we are. We should, we should love our lifestyle. We should love our thing. Did you know that just two chapters earlier, before chapter 4 of 1 John, this is what he says in sec, uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. Listen, this is what he says. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. 
For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. Next time, don't be tricked by the world. They try to trick you to love their sins. Their lo- yes, love the sinner with the purpose of preaching the gospel and bringing them into, into a relationship with Christ. Not at one moment should you love the sin or the sinful lives. Um, and show them this verse. The important thing to note is that God is visible. God is proof that He loves us through our unconditional love for one another in Christ. Look, let's admit it, right? Not, I mean, look in the church, not everyone is like personality clashes happens. Some some people like "Eh," rub each other the wrong way kind of thing. That's bound to happen in church. But that's the reality of it, you know. When outside people come in and look, look, you guys have personality clashes, but man, I still see your love for each other. That's unusual. I mean, like, this guy is so abrasive, or this woman is so what? It's like, but you love each other. You still love each other. And that shows them that God is with us. So when you love God, you do see God. But when you love other believers, others see God. That's the implication of it. The importance of being in church is the very reason for this, that we love each other. So God loves you. Next time you hear that, I hope that you will remember three things. So God loves you because He is love. God loves you, not that you loved Him, but because He loved you in Christ first. And God loves you, so you love His people. That is what our command is from our Lord who loves us. In terms of application, what are what the practical things? Well, a few things I suggest we could try if you want to really understand the deeper meaning of God loves you. One, read the Old Testament God as God who is love. Lucas just read the passage from, Noah, uh, from, from, uh, from Genesis and talk about God's um, wrath on mankind. Read that as God who is love doing all that. Everything that God does in the Old Testament, God has not changed in the New Testament God is love in the Old Testament as well. The reason I say this is when you read it that way, your mind will start thinking, hang on, God is love. Why is this happening? But you're thinking about this in the frame of God's love. He's doing this because He is love. And they, I tr- trust me, I've tried it. You will have a new understanding of what love is. Second thing, practical thing is, you know, we'll never love Jesus Christ as much as we want to, as, as much as we love, want to love the Lord our God with all our heart and soul and mind, we can't, not in our own strength. But I'm asking you to do it, love God and be loved by Him through Christ. Through Jesus Christ, we receive God's love. Through Jesus Christ, we give love to God. That little bit that we give Jesus Jesus will turn it into an acceptable sacrifice to God. Love through Jesus. And the third thing, offer unconditional love for believers. This is proof that God is amongst us. All of us in KCC love each other unconditionally. I know we have our squabbles. Of course we have our squabbles. I've been in this church for about 30 years. Ooh, we've got squabbles, all right? But, but we love each other. Continue to love each other because Christ, because Christ has done 
everything for us out of love. So God loves you. I hope you have a deeper sense from John that, that this is deeper than just God loves you. God loves you in a way that is so beyond imagination. Let us dwell on it. Let us learn, dig deep, because there's so much on earth there for us. So in closing, I'd like to play, as those of you who have been in this church for a while, you probably have heard this song before, but to me, I discovered this song about 20 years ago, I think, or 25 years ago, and I think it's the greatest love song in the entire world. It remains the greatest love song in my heart because in this song is the very heart of God, of love. Everything in this song is like God talking to us because it is scriptural. So let's listen to this song before we close.
Okay, let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, Father of love, thank you for being the God who is love. The God who loves us not because we loved you, the God who would dwell in love amongst your people. Forgive us, those of us who think that we deserve your love, for we didn't deserve your love. We don't deserve your love, and we will never deserve your love. Instead, give us the grace to receive your love in abject, undeserving humility through Jesus Christ, your Son, who is your very word of love to us. Forgive those of us who think that we don't deserve your love for dwelling upon this thought because we have been looking at ourselves and not at Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour, from whom all love flows. Forgive those of us who know we don't deserve your love, yet have experienced your love, but have not shown love for your people in church. Holy Spirit, please help us to receive your love through Jesus Christ, to love you through Jesus Christ, and to love all of Jesus' disciples, that people will visibly see God in the church. Now, KCC, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Right, before you go, 